understand that I arrived in Santa Barbara on the day it's rained earlier in the fall than in living memory. <laughs> so uh, we get so much sunshine in Denver, it's nice to have a break now and then and uh, appreciate your uh, providing that for me. In case you're wondering what the uh, stool is doing up here, I have a knee that uh, is missing certain crucial parts, so I will not be able to stand between now and 9 o'clock or however long we go, and from time to time I will sit, but uh, hope that that doesn't disrupt your evening too much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Now let me give you the real title of, uh, <laughs> actually it was close. Um, you should have a handout in front of you uh, that you were given which uh, I tried to, to put enough detail on it so that those of you that really don't want this to feel like another class um, can at least have an idea where I'm going and you can, uh, as they say in the IMAX theaters, sit back and relax. Um, but for those of you that really are serious students, there's at least little tiny bits of space for you to jot a note or two. I've entitled this New Developments in Historical Jesus research, which is simply a, a pompous way of referring to the fact that Jesus continues to be the topic of uh, extensive writing and research, uh, all the way from very popular best-selling books in uh, the average secular bookstore, all the way to very technical works of biblical scholarship. And I want to uh, survey the landscape with you a little bit tonight, uh, let you know what's out there. Some you will have probably heard of, much may be new to you. And then try to uh, help evaluate a little bit of uh, what that landscape involves and then bring us to some conclusions and as Landon mentioned, throw it open for what I hope will be a good time of discussion. I start by referring, perhaps arrogantly, to what I have called popular mythology. But I think it would be fair to say that uh, university professors from whatever spectrum or background or ideology would agree on one thing, and that is that not every book about Jesus, however new or touted or marketed it may be in the popular bookstore, necessarily reflects scholarship at all. And I've given three categories of works that may be well-known or not so well-known in various circles that uh, fall under what I have labeled popular mythology. The first, still sounding very arrogant, I have labeled perspectives unrelated to any real historical evidence. Um, one example of several that I can think of is uh, a professor uh, retired from the Department of Atmospheric Sciences uh, just up the coast, uh, a state from here at uh, Oregon State University, who uh, in his retirement became interested in UFOlogy and became convinced that uh, a German document that he read by a German UFOlogist uh, was in fact the original Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it looked very much like uh, the Bible's Gospel of Matthew, except at key points where Jesus wound up being an alien from outer space who came to this planet to dispense New Age wisdom. Rather remarkable that someone who's had an illustrious career as a university professor in a particular field could fall for something like this and write two books, one of which was published by an almost reputable academic press. But it's out there. Uh, a brand new book that is a very good book uh, this year by a man named Robert Van Voorst uh, on the evidence for Jesus outside the New Testament has one lengthy introductory chapter which does nothing but refute the various people throughout uh, the history of modern scholarship who have tried to deny that Jesus ever existed. Notwithstanding the fact that there's all kinds of non-Christian evidence from the ancient world to support that. That stuff is out there, people know about it, and an informed response needs to be made. Then there's a, a second category that I've labeled distortion 
or misrepresentation of recently discovered evidence. Now I'm using recently very generously here, as in within the last 50 years or so, given that Christianity's been around for 2000. The Dead Sea Scrolls, most of you undoubtedly will have at least heard of them, discovered in Israel just after World War II, have both in their initial finding and then in the 1990s, after a flurry of translation efforts completed the previously untranslated fragments, have at times spawned all kinds of sensationalist claims in the media, many of which are simply not true. One of the strangest, and uh, she continues to write even as we speak, are the writings of an Australian scholar by the name of Barbara Thiering. I had the privilege of speaking in Australia for three weeks in August and was running into people who had heard about her work uh, in a number of different contexts, who argues that uh, because of what we learned about Jewish backgrounds from uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Jewish community that uh, uh, went out into the Judean wilderness and created a kind of a commune and, and set up religious rules for themselves, that we can now go back to the New Testament and decode it and discover that all of the main characters, Jesus and Paul and the various apostles, were actually Essene Jews and also members of this uh, monastery at a site called Qumran. Nobody in the scholarly world, to my knowledge, of any spectrum, uh, of any place on the spectrum, has accepted this theory. But it's out there and it's sold more copies of books than anything I'll ever write, which uh, means that I need to continue to worry about the problem of envy um, <laughs> and continue to work on that. Then in a very different category, and there are more examples that could be given in each of these, I've listed what I call unfounded claims of textual corruption. And again, this is not an issue that divides bona fide biblical scholars. Uh, it is widely agreed that the text, particularly of the New Testament, certainly of, uh, of both Testaments compared to works of the ancient world in general, but particularly the New Testament because of the thousands of manuscripts, first in Greek and in other ancient languages that have been preserved uh, from the first millennium of the Christian era, hundreds from the first several centuries, from fragments to relatively complete documents that we are able to reconstruct with 97, some would say 99 plus percent certainty what the original New Testament writers wrote. Now that's a completely different question than do we believe what they wrote? But if we're not even sure if we have accurate copies and translations of what they wrote, then that makes the, the truth question, the question that the Veritas Forum asks, even that much harder to get at. But it's widely agreed that we have the New Testament in particular in better textual shape than any document from antiquity on any topic whatsoever, specifically because it was so crucial to such a large group of people that care was taken that it would be very carefully preserved. That fact is very important in conversations with friends of ours who may represent either the Muslim religion or closer to historic Christianity, the Mormon faith, because in their writings, in the Quran and the Book of Mormon and other writings of Joseph Smith, more particularly, there are claims that the New Testament was not well preserved, either that certain portions had gotten distorted and we don't have the the stories accurately of, of what the people wanted to tell us, or that entire missing books uh, have been left out. At some point we probably need to study a little bit about that so that we can get the facts straight. But now I want to come to what I want to spend most of our time together tonight on and that's what I have called the scholarly spectrum. If scholars are agreed that works in these first three categories do not represent uh, the truth or anything close to it, uh, there is still a huge spectrum within bona fide scholarship with what has been called the quest for the historical Jesus. A quest that really encompasses largely the last 200 years of 
the 2000 that Christianity has existed. In the 19th century, more or less the first hundred years, with a little bit beginning already uh, just before the 19th century, there were many different philosophical schools that all spawned books about the life of Jesus. In an age when science was increasingly coming to doubt the miraculous, there was a rationalist school of philosophy that tried to preserve elements of New Testament faith and the Gospels pictures of Jesus, but explaining the apparently miraculous with rationalistic explanations. Jesus didn't really walk on the water. There were sandbars or stones sh shortly beneath the surface and in the night in a, a stormy uh, period of time on the lake, uh, Jesus walked out on these and it was mistaken for a, a supernatural event and other examples of that kind. There was a philosophical school that increasingly studied the religious work of antiquity in terms of myth and in terms of legend and, and tried to also wrestle with the question of the miracles of Jesus and of the New Testament, not by giving them scientific explanations, but by saying that these were not written as stories designed to communicate historical fact in the first place. Like many religions in the history of the world, they were sacred myth. They were not true stories of something that happened, but they communicated theological truth things that people believed were important. There was a school of philosophy known as Romanticism, which for those of you that haven't studied philosophy has nothing to do with Hollywood movies. Um, back in the, area when, in the era when they were romantic rather than just lustful, which seems to be increasingly the case. Um, and, and out of this school came a, a picture of Jesus as a, a wonderful, kind teacher who inspired the crowds who uh, uplifted and exalted uh, uh, his audiences with lofty thoughts but did little that would uh, embroil him in controversies uh, sufficient to get him crucified. And then there was uh, yet another school of thought that today, after another century has passed, is sometimes called the old or the 19th century liberal position, influential in many aspects of the settling of America back before we had crowded this country to the extent that we have now. And there was optimism that Americans in particular and, and Christians as a significant part of them were going to uh, Christianize the earth, were going to create a, a better uh, humanity and a better earth than had ever been seen in his history before. It talked about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man long before anybody dreamed up inclusive language and the problems that those terms would create. Until at the end of the 19th century, a young German scholar who would live into his 90s, into the 1970s, by the name of Albert Schweitzer, who would go on one day to have an illustrious career in West Africa as a humanitarian uh, doctor, medical doctor, as well as a theologian. Albert Schweitzer wrote a book that was translated into English in 1906 with the title, The Quest of the Historical Jesus. And what it was, was a several hundred page, very detailed chronicle of all of the different writers in the 19th century and the philosophical schools of thought they represented who had penned lives of Jesus. And what Schweitzer demonstrated in a very devastating expose was that in virtually every case, these authors had simply recreated, today we might say reinvented, Jesus in the image of the school of philosophy to which they belonged. They were not doing pure historical research by a long shot. Interestingly, some would say ironically, Schweitzer himself was a member of a, a school of theological study that focused on apocalyptic literature literature about the end of the world, literature from the ancient Jewish and Greek and Christian environment about how the only solution to humanity's plight 
would be for God to supernaturally intervene into the universe and recreate what humanity could never make right on its own. And ironically, as some would say, Schweitzer, after convincingly showing how so many others had recreated Jesus in their own image, so to speak, in the minds of many, fell victim to the same error as he portrayed in the closing chapters of his book, a Jesus who was a firebrand of a preacher, a, a radical apocalyptic who believed that God was going to bring about the end of the world within the lifetime of his followers, that his crucifixion would begin the events that would lead to this, but as history has shown, it turned out he was sadly mistaken. And because it became quickly apparent to other scholars that Schweitzer had fell victim to the very same trap that he had so carefully uh, exposed in other writers, a period of time ensued which some more recent scholars have simply dubbed the period of no quest. People still continued to study Jesus, they still continued to write books about him, but not nearly to the same degree, not nearly in the same number, and not nearly with the same confidence that much of anything could be known about Jesus if it seemed we were always doomed to recreate him in his own image. The dominant figure from roughly 1900 to 1950 in uh, New Testament scholarship and in historical Jesus research in particular was another German by the name of Rudolf Bultmann, another man who lived into his 90s and had a very illustrious career. And in one famous quotation in an early writing, Bultmann said that all that we can be certain of about Jesus was that he existed. He moderated that skepticism as his career went on, and in fact he wrote a detailed book about the history of the synoptic tradition, the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in which he did indicate a number of things that he believed could be said about Jesus, but it was a very small shell of the sum total of the four Gospels in the New Testament. Interestingly, philosophically, Bultmann was an existentialist, and his Jesus was also an existentialist. But after World War II and all of the upheavals that that created in university life around the Western world, a trio of Bultmann's former graduate students, all now beginning and well into uh, New Testament teaching careers, two of them German, Ernst Käsemann and Günther Bornkamm, and one of them, an American who still teaches uh, here in Southern California, though in retirement, James Robinson, all got together at a reunion in Marburg, Germany for former students of Rudolf Bultmann and held a conference in which papers were given. A couple of them were entitled, The New Quest for the Historical Jesus. And these students had come to the conclusion that the skepticism of Bultmann was unwarranted and that more could be said and known about this figure who was the founder of Christianity. They analyzed Jesus' sayings in considerable detail. They suggested that he did and said things that uh, at least implicitly suggested that he believed he was God's agent use the term cautiously, Messiah, if you like. But because of the era still coming out of the events of World War II, they focused, in the minds of most scholars who have subsequently read them, too much on Jesus' uniquenesses against his environment and too little on the ways that Jesus was thoroughly and comfortably Jewish in his first century Jewish milieu. And so that movement too, after having its heyday in the early 50s and into about the mid-60s, began to tail off and from roughly the mid-60s to about 1980, there was again a, a diminishing of interest and scholarly research in Jesus.
That brings us to the last 20 years, if my arithmetic is still correct, 1980 to 2000, and what I have now labeled the current diversity. Perhaps the most publicized group of individuals to write and talk about Jesus in the last 20 years is a group that from the perspective of a number of outsiders to their movement still smacks of Bultmann and the New Quest in terms of a, a fairly outdated historical methodology and that is the famous Jesus Seminar. Uh, centered for many of its events here in Southern California, publishing with Polebridge Press out of Sonoma. Robert Funk and John Dominic Crossan and Burton Mack, perhaps the three scholars who uh, are both the most famous and most have spearheaded that movement from the mid-80s until quite recently. They became famous because they courted media attention and created two large books that were published in the 90s where every verse in the four Gospels and an apocryphal document known as the Gospel of Thomas were color-coded either red, pink, gray, or black according to the probability they thought that Jesus really said or did that particular item. Uh, when they came out with their book on the sayings of Jesus, the uh, news that was flashed around the country was that only 18% of all of the sayings in all five Gospels were colored either red, Jesus said it exactly that way, or pink, we have it at least close. And only three sayings out of the entire Gospel of John were anything other than black, which means there must be some mistake. And that was a direct quote of the Jesus Seminar. But when one studied their methodology, uh, one wasn't surprised by some of the results. As presuppositions, they ruled out of hand anything that is attributed to Jesus that can't be detached from its context. Unless something could have circulated as a short, proverbial, potentially cryptic saying all by itself, it doesn't qualify. Well, that wipes out a considerable amount to start with. Jesus could never have talked about the future. Never matter the question of whether he could predict the future. He, he didn't even talk about it. He never talked about judgment because judgment is not a worthy concept of an enlightened religion. He never talked about himself. No, it's not that he just didn't make exalted claims for himself. He never talked about himself and identified who he was in any category. Anybody know any religious teacher in the history of the world that didn't do that? And so it's not surprising that the resulting portraits of Jesus uh, have been called by some uh, more akin to a cynic sage, using cynic in the technical sense of the Greco-Roman school of philosophy of the wandering cynics, itinerant philosophers who love to subvert the cultural mores of the day and point out flaws with received tradition and received wisdom and, and act in very countercultural ways in public. Never mind the fact that cynicism is the Greco-Roman philosophy that had least inroads into Israel of all, this is the portrait that emerges in many circles. But there is another spectrum. There is another development that is much more encouraging that has increasingly been called the third quest of the historical Jesus. Some of its defining characteristics include very different from the first two, a conviction that any convincing portrait of Jesus must ground him thoroughly in early first century Israeli Judaism. He must make sense in a Jewish context even when he differed from many of his contemporaries. It's not enough for the third quest to focus somewhat atomistically on individual sayings and deeds and try to uh, rank their probability, but one has to ask broader integrating questions. What were Jesus' aims? What were in his intentions? Uh, 
particularly what on earth got him crucified, the most secure fact historically, because we know it from both Jewish and Greco-Roman sources from the ancient world, what in the world got him crucified under Pontius Pilate? What was so dangerous or perceived to be dangerous or subversive about this man? And so different kinds of portraits are beginning to emerge. There's a growing appreciation that science has not disproved the miraculous in the least. Science by definition can only adjudicate on that which follows laws that are recurring and that can be traced and repeated in the laboratory with experiments. If there is a God, then it makes sense that he could, if he chose at times, suspend or work through in unique ways uh, the forces of nature in ways that we cannot explain. And there is a recognition that the historical support, again, not simply within Christian sources, but outside Christian sources as well from the ancient world, is extremely strong that Jesus was perceived as a miracle worker. And there is increasing agreement to cross many different uh, parts of this spectrum that Jesus did indeed see himself as some kind of Messiah, some kind of Savior sent from God in ways that would have been perceived by at least some in his world as uh, too exalted a claim and which could indeed get him in trouble with various authorities. Now even as we keep narrowing things down, from the mythological to the scholarly to the old scholarship to newer scholarship to better newer scholarship. Uh, there still is a, a broad spectrum. A very helpful book by a man named Ben Witherington called The Jesus Quest, just out a couple of years ago. Uh, I have shamefacedly plagiarized the next titles from him, but since I've now acknowledged it, it's no longer plagiarism. There are scholars who have focused on elements in the Gospels that portray Jesus as what we might call a charismatic holy man. Someone who, like one or two other Jews that were written about in ancient rabbinic literature, completely outside all of the typical institutional channels of religious power, nevertheless uh, had a uh, uh, a charisma to their personality that attracted masses, taught uh, important and helpful religious truths, had a reputation for working miracles, and challenged the authorities because they were perceived as a threat both in popularity and power to those authorities. There is another approach that has been labeled by Witherington Jesus as a social reformer. And I've listed some scholarly names under all of these circles uh, that you probably don't want to hear about in detail in this context. But we can get into them in the question and answer time if you'd like. There is an element in the Gospels that seems legitimately to point to Jesus as uh, a wandering teacher who was trying to begin a renewal movement within Judaism and bring people who had fallen away from the morals of their own religion and the practices of their scriptures back to God, and who in doing so uh, attracted crowds of others who went on the roads, much like a peripatetic philosopher in the Greco-Roman world, and literally uh, took his message around the countryside that he was in many ways uh, protesting against social corruption and injustice in his society and preaching uh, a love for one's enemy, which is not a popular message in, in many cultures, uh, modeling a kind of non-violent resistance to oppression and injustice in ways that could very much irk both religious and political authorities in his day. There's another school that perhaps has uh, received uh, as much attention as any in this set of categories that harks back to Schweitzer's emphasis on Jesus as a prophet, one who looked to the future and who looked for God to soon intervene and create uh, a new world and a new world order. 
It hasn't always been attached to the notion that Jesus had a timetable for all of this so that one can look back and say he was mistaken. But there are some, including two books that are, are brand new this past summer, uh, one by Paula Fredrickson uh, from the University of Boston and one by Bart Ehrman from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill that uh, have tried to revive even that dimension of Schweitzer's approach. Then there are writers who have focused on all of the allusions throughout Jesus' teaching to that body of Jewish literature known as wisdom literature. Books like Proverbs and Psalms and Ecclesiastes. Uh, other intertestamental Jewish works that contained further uh, proverbs and wise instruction and that began to develop a notion found already in the Old Testament in Proverbs 8 and 9 of God himself being personified as uh, wisdom so that wisdom isn't just an abstract virtue but begins to uh, be a lady who can call out to the young men of the streets come and and learn from me and find wisdom from God. That branch can be subdivided into two quite different approaches. There is a, a, a burgeoning feminist scholarship, including in the study of the historical Jesus. Uh, the matriarch of that movement is almost certainly Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza, uh, now in partial retirement for many years at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, where the emphasis was on the fact that in both Hebrew and in Greek, wisdom was personified as a woman. And exploring all of the possibilities of uh, Jesus alluding to and drawing on this divine feminine tradition. A man like Ben Witherington, a professor at Asbury Seminary in Kentucky, who also wrote the Jesus Quest that I alluded to, uh, isn't so much concerned with gender issues as simply to show Jewish precedents for how Jesus and subsequent Christians could use language that sounded like language of divinity when the Jews were so unrelentingly monotheist. There is only one God and you cannot create another God. And then perhaps at the most conservative end of the spectrum are a number of scholars, not all of them evangelical Protestants by any means, who have focused on the question of Jesus seeing himself as a Messiah, even if he was, we might call, a marginalized Messiah, one who was not ultimately viewed in those categories by many in his world. One of these scholars, and I think now is the time for me to both sit down and take off my coat, basically because it's hot up here. I guess you're making up for the cool day I came into. Uh, a specific focus on a man who I think has done the work uh, that, is, that may be the most significant historical Jesus research of the past decade, if not in a considerable longer time than that. His friends call him Tom Wright. His books use NT. If you want to tackle a, a bite-sized bit of right, he has written a little book called Who Was Jesus? If you want to tack a, tackle a medium-sized book, he has written The Challenge of Jesus. And if you want to get your PhD in New Testament, you will need to read the 700 small print pages, Jesus and the Victory of God. Right like many in the third quest, takes the more holistic or integrative approach of asking a narrative question. In all the diversity of first century Judaism, he observes there is one particular feature that any Galilean peasant fisherman waking up and going out to the lake for his morning's work would have daily been reminded of. The Jews, you see, believed that they were God's elect people. They believed that God had chosen to deal with them in certain unique ways that he had not chosen to deal with any other people he created. They believed their scriptures were the infallible, inerrant word of God, 
And in those scriptures, Christians today call them the Old Testament, it was said over and over and over again that if the Jews would follow God and accept his covenant, they would live in the promised land. They would live in the land of Israel, and they would live in the land in freedom from any invading power, and in peace without warfare, and in prosperity, enjoying the fruit of the land. But you see, in the first half of the first century, Rome had been an occupying force since 63 BC. No one living in the time of Christ, except perhaps the very oldest, by the time he began his public ministry, could ever have remembered a time when the Jews were a free people in the land the infallible God had promised to them in their inerrant scriptures. And so the question was, what went wrong? And what are we to do about it in order to claim those promises? Wright also wrote a book called The New Testament and the People of God, which goes into Jewish backgrounds in great detail and in, in a very fascinating way takes a look at all of the different Jewish groups and sects that, that we've ever uncovered and know about. And one can differentiate them in, in very helpful ways by asking and answering as best we can that specific question. The problem was the problem of exile, of not living in freedom. Many Jews were literally in exile, scattered around the Roman Empire, but even those that were living in their homeland were not living in freedom, free to enact and enforce their own laws and obey their God in all the ways they wanted to. What's gone wrong and what are we to do about it is an excellent way to get a handle on all the diversity of first century Judaism. Jesus, as a first century Jew, belongs in that spectrum of answers. And Wright's thesis, boil down the 700-page book or the 300-page book or the 150-page book to one sentence, which would never be fair, but we'll try anyway, is that Jesus came announcing that the exile was over without one Roman soldier having been removed from his post. Makes no sense. How can this be? Well, because in Jesus' teaching, according to Wright, and I think he's right, Jesus implicitly and explicitly made five significant redefinitions of very central Jewish tenets. He redefined monotheism. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, is straight out of the heart of the Jewish law, and Jesus quoted it and affirmed it. But yet he spoke about himself, and he spoke about the invisible spirit of God in ways that would at least plant the seeds for what later was called the doctrine of the Trinity that somehow God was involved with himself and with the spirit that empowered him in a way that at the very least became problematic for many Jewish people. Secondly, he redefined the doctrine of election. No, I'm not talking about Bush versus Gore. I already voted, by the way. We have early voting in Denver. Maybe you do too, and so I did that last Tuesday. I won't tell you. Um, <laughs> That would be to change the topic. Instead of one ethnic group being the guaranteed ticket to being part of God's chosen people, Jesus taught that his followers of any ethnic group, certainly all of his first followers were Jews, but not all Jews became his followers. Only a small minority did. He also traveled occasionally outside of Israel, engaged in brief ministry to Gentile, non-Jewish people, and planted the seeds for a substantial Gentile mission following his death. Thirdly, he implicitly and explicitly redefined liberation or salvation, 
Rome was not the worst enemy. Satan was. The devil. Or to put it another way, it's not political freedom that is the most important issue. It's spiritual freedom. Although we do have to remember that the separation of church and state was an American notion invented a little over 200 years ago and nobody would have thought of politics and religion not being intimately intertwined in the ancient world. Fourthly, he redefined the Messiah and his role, focusing on passages of scripture, particularly out of the prophecies of Isaiah 52 and 53 that spoke about a suffering servant who would be despised and rejected and die and the sins of the world would be placed on him and by his sufferings humanity would be healed. Text that most Jews thought was being fulfilled corporately by the people of Israel. That they were suffering for the sins of the world Jesus understood that as a messianic job description, if you like. And so instead of leading a group of soldiers in warfare against Rome, saw his death as central to his mission. And then finally, and fifthly, redefined the notion of a new age, of a messianic age, of that coming time of a, a golden era of peace and prosperity as something that in fact would have to come in two stages. So that there were many Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in his lifetime, but that there were many left to be fulfilled including the vision of universal peace and lion lying down with the lamb and a little child uh, leading the wild animals without being harmed. That reconstruction of Jesus, I would like to suggest, makes sense and it helps us to answer some of those bigger questions like why was Jesus crucified? Now, Wright is a believer but he writes, a lot of puns here, as a historian and does not intentionally presuppose his belief in his historical work. So one of the things that he very helpfully does is develop a historical methodology considerably more sophisticated than the previous quests have developed. Where in the past the tendency has been to see Jesus just in his uniqueness over against Judaism, Wright develops what he calls the double similarity and dissimilarity criterion. What does that mouthful mean? Well, he points to a number of features of repeated, frequently attested information about Jesus, both inside the Gospels and elsewhere, that fulfills actually four separate criteria. This criterion really has four parts to it. First of all, it must make sense within first century Judaism. Nobody can be so totally different from their culture that, that they're not even intelligible within it. But secondly, for Jesus to have had the effect and in essence start an entirely new religious movement, he had to have differed in significant ways from conventional Judaism. Similarly, there will be lines of continuity between what he did and taught and the movement he founded, the early church and emerging Christianity. But there will also be differences, ways in which his followers were not able to keep his high standard, in which some of his harder teachings were misunderstood or toned down. And when one particular theme or teaching fits all four of those criteria, or that one four-part criterion simultaneously, it's quite likely we have genuine historical tradition that wouldn't have been made up by anybody else. Interestingly, a large number of the major themes of the Gospels, particularly Matthew, Mark, and Luke, pass through this grid and come out with flying colors. If all of that approximates what uh, someone simply wearing a historian's hat, not necessarily presupposing faith in God or in the Bible of Christians, if anything like that is close to being true, then we have an explanation for the polarization that occurred in Jesus' day.
and the polarization that is still occurring in many parts of the world as there are a record number of Christians as we speak suffering as martyrs for the Christian faith. More in the 20th century than in the previous 19 centuries of Christian history alone. It's ironic that we can live in the United States and particularly in university campuses but scarcely limited to them where, where the attitude is whatever works for you is fine, you do your thing, I'll do mine, all things are, are equal, all things are equally true when people are dying for their faiths and not just Christianity in other parts of the world where people perhaps recognize better than we do that if certain religious claims are true then other ones are dangerous and cannot be tolerated and vice versa. The redefinitions that Wright describes of Judaism that Jesus brought would have transcended enough of the conventional boundaries of acceptable Jewish faith and in arousing mass interest and attention would have also caught the attention of the Roman authorities who were very concerned to keep the peace and very plausibly explain why Jesus according to the Gospels was condemned by a Jewish court for blasphemy and by a Roman tribunal for sedition or insurrection. Maybe the more astounding question to ask is why did any Jew ever follow Jesus with such radical redefinitions? Not many of them do today. But all of the first Christians were Jews and for at least one generation in early Christianity the substantial majority of Christians were Jews and there has always been a Jewish Christian wing of the church throughout history though in some times and places it has been very small. Maybe the amazing thing is not that Jesus was put to death in his environment but that anybody out of a Jewish milieu followed him at all. How could they have? And here, I think, is uh, an untapped argument that uh, Christians and non-Christians alike have not, I think, wrestled much with. On the one hand, there have been scholars who have done quite a bit of work in, in recent years, perhaps a Canadian man now teaching in Edinburgh, Scotland, by the name of Larry Hurtado, has done more than anyone, to point out that the kind of monotheism that uh, preceded uh, the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome in AD 70 and a, a re-entrenchment of the Jewish religion that followed that date uh, was more diverse, did allow for some pretty exalted things to be said about people who were not God. In the intertestamental Jewish literature, angels, the patriarchs like Abraham and Moses, uh, later heroes of the Jewish faith like Kings David and Solomon, and others are uh, spoken of in very exalted language. There's an intriguing passage in Daniel 7-9 that speaks of two thrones in heaven. One is obviously God's. But who is sitting at his right hand if there is only one God? And there was Jewish speculation that maybe it was an archangel. There is even a document that came out of those Dead Sea Scrolls that proposed it was Melchizedek. And if you know who Melchizedek is, I know you've been a Christian for some time. Either that or you're really a scholar. Uh, an obscure priest back in Genesis who is referred to in a few other passages throughout the Bible. So there was freedom in ways that the Jewish faith later we might say clamped down on to to speak of people other than Yahweh the God of Israel in very lofty heavenly language that's that's part of the logical uh, or conceptual possibility that lies behind Jesus and the Apostles words though admittedly Jesus pushed things further to suggest at least in some sense actual equality with God. The other piece of the argument I think again following a, a, a British writer by the name of James Dunn is what I've called the experiential necessity. These Jews initially 12 disciples, then large crowds, then many of the crowds fell away, 
But immediately after the account of his resurrection, we read of 120, and the Apostle Paul talks about a larger group of 500 who were witnesses. Early in the book of Acts, the numbers are up into the thousands of Jews in the Jerusalem area alone who have become followers of this new movement. There was apparently something in the experience on the one hand, of those who walked and talked and lived and ate and slept with Jesus, whose humanity they never would have questioned, that suggested to them they simply could not describe him within the friendly confines, not of Wrigley Field, near the state where I grew up, but uh, in the friendly confines of conventional Jewish monotheism. They never denied there was only one God, but somehow, they had to start speaking of Jesus in similar language. And for those who only experienced Jesus and his power through the power of the Holy Spirit after the resurrection, they had to say the same thing about that power which they perceived to be a personal power, not an impersonal force that they called the Spirit of God. So, what to conclude? Since my watch says it's time. C.S. Lewis, the famous British writer, professor of English literature, Christian apologist of a generation ago, made very famous a, uh, an argument for Christianity, which was popularized in this country by a, a well-known uh, lifelong member of Campus Crusade, which some of you are part of, Josh McDowell. And the way Lewis posed what McDowell called a trilemma, which is a dilemma plus one, went something like this. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that is Jesus. Namely, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God, unquote. That's the one thing, Lewis writes, we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come, still Lewis's words, they may sound a little harsh in our, our modern age of tolerance, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. If you go back to the pages of the Gospels, you can find all three of those options. You can find some of his brothers and sisters in Mark chapter 3 coming and saying publicly, he's mad. In that same chapter, a little bit further on, you can find certain Jewish leaders saying, he casts out demons by the power of Beelzebul, who was a name for the devil. He was either demented or demonic, to change the alliteration, or he was divine. It's interesting that the most pervasive Jewish tradition, non-Christian Jewish tradition, in several sources over the next four to five hundred years of the era in which Judaism and Christianity overlapped was that Jesus was a sorcerer who led Israel astray. No attempt to deny the miracles, no attempt to deny the exorcisms, in fact tacit admission of both, but convinced that his power was not from God but from a different supernatural, a diabolical power. I entitled the section just before the conclusion, The Resulting Polarization Then and Now. And I'd like to suggest, not that I want to turn the United States into the Middle East. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not for violence. I come from Littleton, Colorado, which probably means something to some of you. But uh, the parts of the world and the places where people hear the message of Jesus carefully enough to realize that stakes of life and death are involved here, probably understand things better, whichever side they come down on, than the sort of general apathetic pluralistic environment of you do your thing and I'll do mine and everything is fine for everybody as long as it works for them. I would hope 
as I trust is the purpose of all of these Veritas forums that you've had a number of in the last few years here, that you would accept the challenge, if you have never done so before, to study Jesus, to study him as a man of history, not necessarily presupposing the truth of Christianity or of the scriptural testimony about him, but that if you do so with an open mind, it will bring you to a point where a decision needs to be made that could lead to an entire change of your life or direction or allegiance because that's what the historical Jesus, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many, though not all, was in fact about. Now we've got uh, a half an hour, uh, or hopefully it gets cooler up here. Um, and I'll uh, indicate the informality by uh, moving the chair, which is easier to move than the podium. Um, we have mics here. The, uh, the ground rules, uh, as have been laid out, are uh, ask a question that is uh, at least marginally related to the topic. Um, please don't ask me uh, uh, something totally unrelated. Um, please don't make any speeches, uh, but uh, please do feel free to come forward. Uh, wait your turn if somebody's in the mic before you, and uh, let's talk about whatever you want to talk about. Here comes somebody, I think. Go for it. I have two questions. The first one, um, I'm not very familiar with ancient history, but I was uh, reading this book, The Penguin Guide to Living Religions. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that? Um, in it, they mentioned that was it uh, some of the letters and maybe even revelations were in dispute during that time between, I guess, different villages. Um, in, in the region, that they weren't really sure which ones to include, which to exclude. Some mm. were excluded that should have been included. Maybe some were included that should have been excluded. And your second one? Um, oh, okay. The other one was... Just to see if I can relate them in any way. All right. Uh, actually, I don't know if the other one's related at all. Oh, okay. Well, let me tackle yeah. that one. Um, and if anybody else comes to a mic, I'll, I'll let somebody else go first before we give him a second, but otherwise, okay. fair enough. Um, what I'm, what I'm suspecting uh, you were reading uh, from that description is uh, a question not directly related to uh, Jesus and not directly related to the Gospels, but certainly related to the question of how Christianity got the entire package of 27 books that came to be known as the New Testament. Um, there were seven of those 27 books um, and you were right, including the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, at the end of the New Testament, as well as seven different letters, uh, the letter to the Hebrews, um, several short one-chapter letters, such as 2 John, 3 John, and Jude, um, also 2 Peter, what am I up to, missing one, uh, James being the seventh, um, that were uh, not immediately accepted as the church began discussing canonicity, which is the question of which works to include. The reasons why there was some debate over those seven um, vary. There was debate over Hebrews because there was no claim in the text for an author, so there was uncertainty as to who wrote it. There was debate over the book of James because as Martin Luther centuries later would reopen the debate, James seemed to stress good works in a way that, that Paul didn't. Uh, there was debate over the three short little letters just because they were so short and little used and not as well known. There was debate over 2 Peter because there was question whether Peter was indeed the author. And there was debate over Revelation for the same reason there is today. People didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> Such a strange book. Um, and there were uh, other books at times that uh, different groups uh, often small sectarian groups uh, valued. Um, it's hard to tell going back and assessing the evidence whether they, they actually valued them to the same degree as the other 20 to 27 books. Um, there were a couple that uh, did get suggested uh, 
for inclusion, uh, but were, uh, were not accepted with nearly the same amount as the others. Um, that, that debate is an important one. It's a, it's a good issue to talk about. It's, it's not necessarily relevant to making a decision about Jesus because the heart of the gospel, the heart of the Christian claim, uh, is amply contained in the 20 books that were never contested, the four gospels, the book of Acts, uh, and all of the letters of Paul. Um, so it's a little bit tangential, but I understand why you raise it. I see nobody else at the mic, so have a shot at number two. All right. Um, the last one is just what we, you finished with. You mentioned that uh, the Jews in the first five centuries after his death believed him to be a supernatural sorcerer. Um, just would like to know what you based that on. Would, uh... um, you have one famous uh, uh, paragraph in length from the writings of the uh, first century Jewish historian Josephus. Uh, that refers to him as a worker and the Greek word that is used there is the word we in English get our word paradoxes from. Kind of an interesting term. But then the, the uh, encyclopedic body of work that uh, became next only to the Bible itself, the Christian Old Testament, the most authoritative document for Orthodox Judaism, was the collection of writings known as the Talmud, uh, a Palestinian version appeared in roughly uh, the 300s, a Babylonian edition in the 500s, and in about five or six different texts scattered around the Talmud, uh, one of which I was directly quoting, uh, said he was a sorcerer who led Israel astray, and the gist of that is, is repeated in several other places. If you want to see all of the evidence conveniently laid out for that and for Jesus outside the New Testament, the book by Van Voorst, which is Van, V-O-O-R-S-T, uh, that Erdman's published in 2000, last spring, uh, Jesus outside the New Testament is a good source for that. Thanks for both of those. Good questions. Was it uh, Jewish officials or just were they... Jewish rabbis, Jewish leaders. Rabbis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you Good. very much. You bet. Yes, sir. Um, my question is about Jesus and his relationship to Mormonism, mm. and how I don't really know really anything about it. And I was just wondering how I've heard that he, at some point in his career, came to maybe near South America or somewhere around there. I was just wondering if you could sure. elaborate on sure. that. Joseph Smith, who was born in New York State in the early 1800s, uh, claimed to have uh, an appearance at age 14 of God the Father and Jesus as two identical embodied people who appeared to him and uh, set him on his uh, uh, spiritual pilgrimage and career. Uh, there were subsequent appearances, so Joseph claimed, by angels. Uh, including the angel Moroni, who, if you've ever seen a Mormon temple, sits atop their temples with his, with his trumpet, and uh, predicted that a time would come when it would be revealed to Joseph uh, where he could find buried uh, golden tablets of ancient scripture that had uh, been deposited there by uh, what we today would call Native Americans centuries ago. Um, and uh, at the appointed time, as he tells the story, he was directed to a hill by the name of Kumora, also in New York State, and uh, dug and uncovered golden tablets and was given over a, a period of, uh, a considerable period of time with the help of, of various friends, uh, the supernatural ability to translate these tablets. And what emerged in English uh, is what we know today as the Book of Mormon. Uh, there is, of course, uh, a massive debate surrounding the origins of the book. Um, the story itself, in a nutshell, which really doesn't do justice to all of its details, but to, to boil the story down to a nutshell, is that a group of Jews, uh, 400 plus years before Christ, closer to 600 uh, BC, uh, migrated across West Africa, across the Atlantic Ocean, into Central America, spread out among the Americas, uh, fought wars with the people that we knew as the American Indians, that Jesus at some point, not long after his death and resurrection in Israel, had a similar uh, exalted appearance to uh, Native Americans, uh, perhaps in Central America, 
and uh, that then over time the knowledge of uh, Jesus' revelation died out as this tribe of people died out and one of the last things that was done was that this record was buried um, now to be revealed again in these last days and uh, that was Joseph's message in a nutshell um, there were some distinctive doctrines that over time God increasingly revealed to him as he claimed and uh, people who believed the story uh, became uh, the initial followers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, it continues to be a, a very uh, controversial movement it has spawned uh, a large research university that's very respectable in many academic fields Brigham Young University in Provo Utah um, it has it boasts the largest department of religion anywhere in the world all of its 20,000 students in any given semester must take one religion course um, and I have good friends who who teach there that I've gotten to know through several different avenues um, interestingly uh, a number of years ago uh, with all the archaeological interest and and there has been a wing of Mormonism that has tried to to find remains of these ancient peoples in the New World and evidence of the the battles and the various activities the Smithsonian Institute after a barrage of questions uh, uh, created an official document that basically said to date no archaeological discovery has ever corroborated a single distinctive claim of the Book of Mormon uh, what has been corroborated are things that Mormonism and historic Christianity share um, but uh, that does not keep many people increasingly from joining the movement so that's the story in a nutshell I'm trying to be fairly objective as I say it so that if any Mormon friends are here you'll feel I've said it fairly let's see so you first then we'll go over there and oh arts just wandering okay yeah, uh, this is actually more of a clarification. Okay. <clears throat> but for your discussion of the new quest, I think I heard you say something that certain of these scholars were too emphatic on understanding Jesus as a Jew. And if Other I understood way around. that, okay. Yeah. Um, the, from, from 2020 <clears throat> hindsight, which is always greater, <laughs> um, it, it has seemed to many that because it was largely a German movement and it was largely a movement still pretty fresh from the experience of those who lived through the Nazi era that that the emphasis was too much on Jesus uniquenesses okay. versus his Jewish milieu uh, God forbid Jesus turned out to be Jew um, because uh, we just tried to exterminate all of right. them to put it quite crassly okay yeah Thank good you. sir could you give us some um, context of what a first century Middle Eastern Jew was about uh, what do we know from anthropology what do we know from uh, archaeology uh, to maybe give us a, a better picture of a profile of this uh, this man Jesus as he would have been in the uh, you know first three decades of the, uh, the millennia there and they write whole books on that how much time do we have <laughs> um, good question uh, I think one thing that's important to say up front is uh, sometimes particularly Christians who just learn a few names like Pharisees and Sadducees, Zealots, Essenes, sort of think it's kind of like Republicans and Democrats, that everybody falls into one category, uh, when in fact the vast majority, probably our best estimates, 95% of Jewish people in first century Palestine uh, were ordinary folks. In fact, the Pharisees came up with a term for them, which in Hebrew was the Am Haaretz, which means the people of the land fairly neutral term but they kind of used it like the Greeks used the hoi polloi the masses the many the the rabble it doesn't know much um, the average Jew would have been uh, a farmer uh, or a fisherman or a carpenter or a small artisan a potter uh, but some kind of trade uh, most of them agricultural workers um, if he was faithful as most of them seem to have been certainly uh, far more so than the diversity of Judaism worldwide today um, they would have very faithfully uh, circumcised all their male children they would have gone to temple if they could make the distance three times a year at festival time they would have very scrupulously observed Sabbath every Saturday from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown 
uh, resting from anything that qualified as work. Uh, they would have attended the synagogue for worship on a weekly basis. They would have educated their male children from ages 5 to 12 in an elementary school education that only taught one subject, the Bible. Uh, and rote memorization was the only method of teaching. We have made some progress. Well, then again. <laughs> they had a rule you couldn't discuss uh, any given scripture until you had accurately memorized it, and we might avoid some problems if we reinstituted that one. <laughs> but uh, um, the average person was too busy just trying to eke out an existence living for him or herself. Uh, women had a relatively limited uh, number of uh, roles open to them um, in terms of uh, what we today would call domestic work, but it certainly was hard work uh, to uh, provide for the family, to be the main rearer of children in what was usually large families, to do all the cooking without any modern conveniences, uh, to perhaps tend a garden, to uh, wash clothes by hand to haul water at times from long distances, things that if any of you are here from the two-thirds world, you could probably give this lecture as, as easily as I could in many impoverished parts and rural parts of our world today. Uh, it was only a handful of uh, the more well-to-do, the more fortunate, who had time for the deep theological discussions and debates. Uh, and who then separated themselves into various groups according to the way that, that they would answer these various questions. Uh, but the advantage of, of something like what Tom Wright does is to distinguish between what are the things that were true of, of all Jews. They all believed in one God. They all believed that they were the elect people, as far as we can tell. Uh, they all believed that uh, a time was coming when God was going to create a messianic era and things were going to be a whole lot better than they were now. And finally, all of those unfulfilled promises throughout their history were going to be fulfilled. Um, you didn't have to belong to any one of the sects. You didn't have to debate the issues the sects debated. Um, those things you knew, you believed, but you have what psychologists today would call cognitive dissonance. You believed them, but they weren't happening. So now what? That's maybe the short answer, and it may not have sounded very short. Yeah. In your survey of the literature, you mentioned Bart Ehrman. Yeah. And um, I have a question related to an early topic you took up, the um, unfounded claims of textual corruption. Um, professor, I'm not referring to Ehrman's work there. Right. Professor Ehrman's written a book, uh, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. Right. And um, as I, I believe what he claims there is that in the fourth century um, disputes over the nature of the deity of Christ, the followers of Athanasius actually changed the text of the New Testament, altered it in certain ways that would support their claims over against Arius. And I'm wondering if you have some sure. thoughts on that sure. question. Um, excellent question. Didn't know there would be anybody here. Such a sophisticated question. Um, UCSB has now gone up to right up there with Harvard. And, no, <laughs> just joking. Um, ouch, somebody says didn't like that comparison. Um, I can see this topic isn't interesting as people file out. Um, when, when I spoke about textual corruption, I spoke about the claims relatively unique to Islam and Mormonism that entire books of what should have gone into the New Testament were suppressed, uh, deliberately lost and gone forever. I'm talking about claims that uh, the text of John 1.1 1, 1 did not originally read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, that that Word was God just wasn't there. Um, that uh, the claims of, of Jesus' exact divinity and equality with the Father were not in the original text of Scripture. That uh, when uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 talks about there being different kinds of glory among the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars, just like there's a difference between an earthly body and a resurrection body, that the original New Testament, as Joseph Smith rewrote it, actually read that there will be three categories of bodies in the, in the celestial and the terrestrial and the telestial kingdoms, that there are several hundred places in the New Testament where Joseph Smith, through inspiration, rewrote passages of the Bible or of the New Testament, uh, and that those, in fact, reflected the original text, even though not a single textual variant 
from antiquity supports it. There still is, having said all that, the genuinely scholarly science of textual criticism. And while I'm sure Ehrman himself would agree, maybe going for the 97% rather than 99%, uh, of the New Testament being reconstructable with a very high degree of accuracy based on the state of the manuscripts that we have, there still were hundreds, thousands of textual variants, because you had thousands of manuscripts, and one of the tendencies uh, that you can, you can see for yourself if, if you care to take the time to do it, um, get a King James Bible and get a, a modern translation, NIV, NASB, RSV, or whatever, and uh, read a long stretch of Paul's epistles, and you will find places where the modern translations, going back to the earliest and, and the most reliable manuscripts, most of which have been discovered since 1611 in the writing of King James, uh, may say Jesus. And later scribes, wanting to exalt Jesus, came and added the word Christ, or added the word Lord, or added both. And uh, there are tendencies, um, the reason for Ehrman's title, The Orthodox Corruption, to take verses of Scripture in, for the most part, just very tiny little ways. Son becomes Son of God, perhaps in a passage in John. Uh, the only Son becomes the only begotten Son, in one text in John 1, 18, I think it is. Um, out of a, a, a probably well-intentioned desire to magnify this Jesus that the scribes copying the manuscripts worshipped. Uh, not good enough to call him Jesus Christ, let's call him the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and so to that extent, uh, there are, are ways in which uh, as we go back and sift through the, the manuscripts, uh, we can assume that that the shorter versions, the, the less um, that titles have tried to be harmonized with language elsewhere is most likely to be original. But that's a far cry from saying, even if you take all of that quote-unquote corruption out, you still have the historic Christian Jesus. You don't, you don't have a different Jesus. You don't have Arianism rather than Athanasian. Christianity, and at that point, I would part company with Ehrman. You referred to uh, Isaiah 52 and 53 mm -hmm. during, during your talk. Uh, could you give us some other examples of Messianic prophecies uh, that are important in your own faith, and how the Jews interpreted those in the first century and perhaps even today? Well, interestingly, uh, a number of them that, that the New Testament takes in a, a messianic fashion um, were taken, uh, at least by some Jews, in that way as well, uh, particularly in the Psalms. Uh, and one of the fascinating results set Barbara Thiering to one side, metaphorically. Um, one of the results of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls has not been to undermine historic Christianity in the least, but to give us a, a much more fascinating insight into the rich diversity of first century Judaism and its predecessors, and in several places to discover Old Testament texts being interpreted messianically, which previously we weren't sure if Judaism ever did, but the New Testament does. So we now know that there is precedent uh, within Judaism uh, of the time for doing that. Uh, one of those is uh, uh, Psalm 2-7, a royal psalm. Christianity has taken it as a messianic psalm, the enthronement of the messianic king. I will proclaim the degree of the Lord. He said to me, the king is saying, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And that whole father-son relationship. Uh, a, a passage that very few Christians ever memorize or think much about, but for your next Bible trivia game, it is the chapter of the Old Testament more often quoted or alluded to in the New Testament than any other one. I won't even see if anybody here knows it, embarrass you. Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, 
Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And then it goes on to also speak about the Lord being a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And those are the two parts that get quoted the most. Jesus himself quoted that, uh, teaching in the temple the last week of his life, taking it with Jewish tradition as a Psalm of David. And there are two lords in the passage. Uh, those of you that have English Bibles that print some lords in all capital letters, that's when it's Yahweh, God, God the Father, as we would call it. Uh, the other Lord is the Hebrew word Adonai, which sometimes can just mean a, a human master, like medieval England had lords and ladies. But when it's David, who is the highest Lord of Israel, saying, Yahweh, God, said to my Lord, there's an exegetical question. Who the other guy? Um, to put it in colloquial, non-university language, appropriate only at five to nine in the evening. Um, and and uh, Jesus quoted that very psalm uh, in the last week of his life and said, how then can the scribes say that the Messiah, the Christ, is in essence merely David's son, merely his human descendant? Must he not also be somebody who is at least exalted above the king of Israel, above whom nobody's exalted? humanly speaking. Um, it's interesting, the Gospels say that nobody could answer him. Nobody in the crowd gave an answer. One of the things we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls was that at least at Qumran, Psalm 110 had been taken as messianic. Those are two examples. Coming down the home stretch, my watch says we have three minutes. Okay, I've been timing it, so. Uh, <laughs> I'm not very well studied in this aspect of it, but uh, Jesus before his ministry and after his birth in that period of time why isn't there very much written about that or why don't you hear very much about that what was going on with him hey don't feel ashamed every entering seminarian class asks me that too and the real honest answer is we're not sure I think there might be a reasonable inference that he didn't distinguish himself in any particularly extraordinary way. It's fascinating to read later early Christian literature. They were preoccupied with the question. What was the boy wonder really like? With apologies to Robin of Batman fame. For those of you that go back that far or watch the reruns or rent the movies. When I was a kid, the first episodes, never mind. Um, or was it Boy Blunder? No, that's what Joker called him. Um, what was the question? <laughs> the early Christian apocryphal literature is filled with stories of Jesus' miraculous feats, uh, breathing life into clay sparrows that he fashioned and watching them fly away, or taking vengeance on a playmate who was taunting him and withering him up, much to the chagrin of his dad, who then went to Joseph and pleaded for him to ask Jesus to undo it, which he did, and the guy was resurrected. Um, and, and just, you know, the carpenter's uh, table that was built, but one leg was shorter than the others, so Jesus stretches out his arm and miraculously makes them level. Great, great stuff. Not a shred of historical support for it. There's always been this, this Christian fascination to want to answer the question, to fill in the hidden years. Fast forward the tape, and in the last four to five hundred years, there's been Christian fiction wrote about Jesus, the young adult, traveling to India to, uh, you know, he was really a closet Buddhist and met with the gurus over there. And, and I can go into Walden Books in Denver and buy the books that people are buying and reading and believing this stuff when, when they won't read or believe the real stuff. Um, but, but the best that I can come up with uh, theologically is uh, the last verse of uh, the Gospel of Luke chapter 2 after that one episode the only one that we're told about in any of the Gospels between age 2 and and 30 ish uh, when uh, he had amazed the teachers in the temple at age 12 even that's not as miraculous um, I, I was at a I didn't even comment on it but I was in a, a friend's uh, uh, where was it was it at Westmont I think where they took me earlier today looking around at paintings on a wall and and at one place there was this this picture of Jesus standing up teaching the 
the Jewish teachers who are all seated around spellbound looking at him in, in amazement. That in fact is the most common medieval artwork for the event of Jesus. And that's not what the Gospel of Luke says at all. It says in verse 46, he was sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. They were still in charge. Now, he did amaze them with his understanding and his answers. You know, he was probably the head of his class, but that's really all it says. And then you come to the end of Luke 2, and he goes back home to Nazareth with Joseph and Mary. He's obedient to them, and we read Jesus grew in wisdom, intellectually, and stature, physically, and in favor with God. He grew spiritually, just like any other human being. You got a problem with that? Deal with the Bible, not with me. And he grew in favor with humans. He grew socially. He was a good Jewish boy. Thank you.